Today I'm going to talk about uh, what biocontrol is, uh, CDA, what biocontrol is, what we do with our program, uh, when and why you should use biological control, uh, and then I'll talk about some specific weeds uh, and biocontrol for some specific weeds that uh, Jonathan asked me to talk about. Uh, and then and finally I'll talk about how our request a bug program works. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I'm with CDA. I've been with CDA for about 14 years. Uh, the la I've been working with uh, the insectary and biocontrol the whole time, but it's only been the last seven years that I've been full-time with biocontrol and I, I really do love my job. Uh, the biocontrol program is housed uh, in one of the eight divisions of CDA, Conservation Services. Conservation Services has a number of programs, including things that might be relevant to what you do, um, including noxious weeds and weed-free forage. Um, the biocontrol program is housed out of the Palisade Insectary. Uh, last year was the 75th year of the insectary. It was started in 1945. We were hoping to have a, a big anniversary celebration. Alas, COVID took that away. Maybe we'll have one coming in the future. Um, it began as a control of Graphilita molesta, which is a pest of peaches and threatened the peach crop in Palisade. And they brought in biocontrol and it worked really well. And uh, it's still going after all this time. Um, we think that it saves uh, peach tree growers several insecticide sprays a year, and you wouldn't have organic peaches um, if it wasn't for this program that we have. Um, and then over the years, uh, the program has developed more uh, biocontrol agents. Uh, and currently we work on about 14 or 15 different pests and have over 20 agents that we work on. Um, our goal is to be a partner in pest management with you, a landowner, and other folks. Uh, we work uh, statewide, we work regionally, nationally, and internationally as well. Um, our main mission is to provide biocontrol agents. Uh, they're free when we're first researching them. Um, once we get well-established uh, agents and they work well, we have a request a bug program. Um, we do monitoring of all the introductions, evaluation, whether they work or not, look for non-target effects, and uh, a big part of our job is to educate the public uh, in the use of biocontrol and just to know that they're there, and that's partly why I'm here today. Um, so what is biological control? Uh, it boils down to basically a reunification of a pest with its natural enemies. Um, it's an ecologically based pest control. Um, its goal is suppression, not eradication. Um, what we do at, at the Colorado Department of Ag is mostly classical biological control. Um, most weeds that we have, noxious weeds, are not from around here. They come from other places, other continents. Um, and part of the reason why they're uh, a pest is they've escaped natural predation. Uh, so biological control is going and finding what naturally feeds on those uh, pests and introducing them. Uh, for example, leafy spurge was introduced, in, was found in the 1920s in the United States. It spread across North America, um, and biocontrol for that was initiated in the 90s. Uh, Aphthalina flea beetles were, were um, brought in in the 80s and 90s, actually. Um, it is, does not involve any genetic modification, or uh, there's no selective breeding. And again, um, the result that we're looking for is suppression of a weed, not uh, necessarily the eradication uh, we're looking to sort of reestablish some balance in, in the nature. Uh, biological control is a safe, effective, inexpensive, and sustainable pest management option. Um, for the safety, um, a, a fairly large study was done uh, recently that looked at um, a bunch of different releases, 512 total releases, that where there was good data. And uh, over 99% of them had no uh, non-target effects or no um, bad effects. Uh, and the few that did were, uh, the, the effects weren't that great. They were very minor non-population non effects. Um, one of the things that governs biological control is laws and regulations of nations, um, world trade and things like that. But also uh, biocontrol practitioners have a code of best practices, which we like to follow. Um, uh, you want to um, ensure that you're finding a host-specific agent um, and that it meets uh, your needs um, and do a lot of monitoring. And uh, that bottom one there, communicate results to the public, is always important. Um, the steps in getting a weed biocontrol agent are, are very important. Um, it takes about 10 years to do that. Um, 
But it first starts with identifying your target correctly, things that are feeding on your target overseas, um, and then research and quarantine work to see if it, if it is host specific. Um, and then you have to get a lot of approvals, uh, both uh, uh, from a technical advisory group, a tag group, and the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, part of uh, the USDA, and then also the Fish and Wildlife, and you're worried about uh, economic plants as well as threatened and endangered plants. Um, there's a lot of field testing, including monitoring that are done, and then finally there's a full-scale implementation if everything works well. Um, the insectary is mainly does, does those last things, field testing uh, and uh, implementation. Um, it is safe. There have been never been any uh, cases in modern weed biocontrol where a biocontrol agent has switched hosts, um, and no biocontrol agents have ever attacked um, crops. Um, there is extensive host range testing for economic crops as well as uh, relatives, congeners, um, and threatened and endangered species as well. So all those, it has to pass all those hurdles before we ever use it. Um, does it work? Is it effective? Um, a, a large study uh, that looked at effectiveness of biocontrol agents and their results um, found that um, at least a third of the introductions led to establishment and a 10% re, uh, resulted in satisfactory control in terms of uh, no more intervention, uh, no more pesticide sprays, no more uh, human intervention needed anymore that the biocontrol agents uh, took over and worked well. Um, and uh, some of the successes uh, have been uh, subtle, some have been very dramatic, uh, including uh, the first real rangeland weed biocontrol was done um, in the uh, 1950s for St. John's wort in Northern California, where uh, the biocontrol works so well, they've established a monument to a beetle, uh, which is probably one of the only places in the world with a monument to a beetle. Um, but it was a, a resounding success. Uh, St. John's wort was uh, basically, they couldn't uh, let sheep or cattle out on those ranges in Northern California and Oregon. Um, they found a couple uh, flea beetles that they were released, and you can see the before and after photos, and uh, the stock growers and the cattlemen and the stock growers are the ones that put that monument up, uh, thanking the beetle for uh, basically um, saving their livelihood there. Um, to this day, it still provides control. There are outbreaks uh, of St. John's Ward occasionally, but the beetle usually comes back and takes care of it, uh, so nobody is spraying St. John's Ward, or they shouldn't be. They should be letting the biocontrol agents do the work. Um, a little closer to home here uh, in Pine, Colorado, um, it, I have an example here of uh, leafy spurge biocontrol that worked really well um, using a combination of uh, aphthona species and Oberia stem borers. Um, and we've seen this kind of success in a lot of places. Um, I wasn't around in the late 90s, uh, Jonathan was, but uh, my understanding was that uh, an area like Chatfield State Park was just... Uh, covered in leafy spurge back then. And, and there's still spur spurge there. Um, and it occasionally has uh, dense pack, um, dense uh, growth of leafy spurge in places, but the beetles are there uh, and there's really no need to spray. Uh, the beetles keep the uh, spurge pretty much in check there. Um, another example, uh, not of the weeds that we're talking about, but uh, one that's a really good uh, example of success would be uh, uh, after the High Park Fire of 2012, the Hewlett Gulch High Park Fire up uh, outside of Fort Collins, uh, the whole hillsides of areas were uh, dominated by a uh, weed called Dalmatian toad flax. They were just, the hillsides were yellow. Um, about 8,000 beetles were released over two years in 2013 and 2014. And uh, to this day, we have monitoring plots and the uh, stem counts went down by uh, 97%. Um, there's a lot of areas up there where there's just no Dalmatian toad flax. And the Dalmatian toad flax that is there, there are weevils that are present. And um, it is probably going to get into sort of a predator prey cycle where uh, the weed has good years depending on moisture, seed bank, those kind of things. And the weevils uh, will build up numbers and keep it in, in check. But um, it's something that it's an area where it would be difficult to spray herbicide and you and so it's really good that biocontrol worked well. Um, it's inexpensive. Uh, there's, for the most part, there's the startup costs. Um, there's basically investment in the uh, research. Uh, but once you let them go and they, they, uh, and they are successful, they reproduce on their own and spread on their own. Um, all of them have good uh, benefit cost ratios over one. 
Um, and then for something like St. John's Ward, I mean, think of all the years of treatment and rangeland that's saved. It's very, uh, very much uh, worth the investment. Uh, again, uh, I kind of mentioned a little bit sustainable. Um, it's self-propagating. Uh, the agents co-evolve with their weeds, so there's no worries about resistance. Um, and it's a good uh, thing to use um, in an integrated pest management program. Uh, it might reduce uh, pesticide resistance. Uh, although, if we're talking mostly rangeland weeds here, you're not going to get too much pesticide resistance in rangeland weed spraying. Um, so when should you use biological control? Well, I always think you should consider it if there's agents available in any integrated pest management approach. Um, and it really depends on what your goals are. Um, if, uh, if your goal is eradication, then biocontrol is not for you. It's mostly for su suppression. Um, if the economics are fail favorable and the, those get better, the, the bigger your weed infestation is. Um, and then are there good biocontrol agents available? And for the three weeds I'm going to talk about, um, there's varying uh, degrees of success here. So leafy spurge. Um, this is the first um, weed. This is the first time in a talk I've called it Euphorbia virgata. And actually, I haven't updated our website with that name. But the taxonomists have decided it's no longer Euphorbia asula. It's a different species. And it's always important to, to know exactly what species you are working on. So that's important. Um, but it is uh, a perennial uh, noxious weed. Um, it first arrived uh, 100, 100, almost 200 years ago. Um, it reproduces uh, from seed, and it also reproduces vegetatively through the root system. Um, it's got a, a, a white, milky latex that's uh, uh, irritant to, uh, to people, can be, and to cattle when they eat it. Um, it can uh, really reduce... Uh, uh, the um, the quality of your range if you have a lot of leafy spurge if, even if you have a minor amount of leafy spurge sometimes cattle will refuse to feed in a in a um, in a pasture um, we have a couple different biocontrol agents for it um, our most successful are the aphthona flea beetles that Jonathan mentioned earlier um, the adults uh, defoliate leaves uh, but the larvae that feed in the roots are what really do the damage to um, to uh, leafy spurge. Uh, and it's very effective in, in rocky soils and sites that are in full sun. Um, and then the other agent that we sometimes catch and release is a longhorn beetle, uh, Oberia eryth erythrocephala. Um, it's a, a longhorn beetle that uh, lays its eggs in the stems, and the, um, it, the larvae um, eat through the stem and kill uh, individual plants and reduce seed set. And uh, those agents are available... Um, usually around mid, uh, mid to late June through July. Uh, I got a few nice bug photos here. Here's some different aphthona, flea spe uh, aphthona species. Um, here's some, uh, some better. Those are about three millimeters long, those, those insects. They're very small. Um, the aphthona nigriscutus is probably the most abundant uh, aphthona species that we find, uh, but we usually can find all four in places. Um, I would say the Aphthona lacertosa, the one up on the upper right, uh, is found more in sort of riparian, wetter areas. Uh, the Aphthona nigriscutus is found in more um, sort of uh, dry land areas. Um, I have a project that I'm working with some folks up in the Yampa River area. Um, in 2011, they had a really severe uh, flood, and it took a lot of spurge down into the Dinosaur National Monument, where it really hadn't been before. Um, and so uh, going upriver to control the leafy spurge in Route and Moffat counties has been very important to the folks at the Dinosaur National Monument. Um, a whole bunch of folks have volunteered on this project. And what we found is that uh, historical leafy, bur leafy spurge biocontrol sites hadn't really been visited. Um, and so we have uh, folks that are going back and checking those out. And the results have been kind of surprising. Uh, beetles are still persistent after some places after 25 years of release. Um, and it appears like the, the beetles and, uh, and the oberia, the longhorn beetle, are keeping the leafy spurge in check and could use just some, a little bit of assistance with uh, collection and re-release. Um, I point out that uh, we have a really nice little guide to uh, identify aphthona species um, at that site. Uh, so Yampa River Leafy Spurge Project com. And uh, if you click on the resources tab, there's a YRLSP, Biological Control Species ID Guide, and then you can see that on the right, um, helps you identify the beetles. So uh, that's a fun little project we're doing. I, I'm kind of thinking that, um, that our neck of the woods, we could maybe try and uh, duplicate those efforts because it's kind of an interesting project. 
Um, if you were to dig up uh, the plants and look at the roots, you could find a larva that looks like that. Um, that would be harder to do. Um, one of the things with apthona that a lot of people notice is the, the beetle bomb. And so that's where you release the beetles and the next year you can come back and you can obviously see results. Um, uh, and then they really like the edges of leafy spurge patches. So there's an example of the before and after photo. Uh, and then here's some better photos of the, um, the longhorn beetle, the oberia, um, which we can find around as well. Uh, and there's the larva that um, feeds down through the stem and gets into the root ground. Um, here's a release map of sort of historical release information uh, that we have for the last, uh, I don't know, 15 years or so. And you can see that the releases uh, correspond with where leafy spurge is still pretty much a problem in the, in the, in the, um, in the state. Um, this is uh, the release map for last year and where we were. You can see there's quite a bit there in Douglas County. Um, especially going out, out towards Elbert County there. That's a, a hot spot. Um, I have a theory that there's a lot of horse properties out there. They may not be getting um, uh, weed-free uh, hay. Um, so if you're in Douglas County and you're buying hay, uh, try and get weed-free hay. That's available. Um, and then here's what it looks like when we release some, either in a container or in a bakery bag, and you just put them out in one spot and let them do their thing. Um, Another uh, weed that uh, Jonathan asked me to talk about, which I know you have a lot of in Douglas County, is diffuse knapweed. Um, diffuse and spotted, spotted knapweed are very uh, similar to each other. Um, they're both um, asters native to Eurasia. Um, uh, these don't; uh, these only produce, um, reproduce by seed, though, uh, as opposed to uh, through rhizomes. A nice little tumbleweed. Um, the difference uh, for diffuse map, knapweed, uh, mostly white flowers um, and flower uh, July to August. Um, you might have some spotted knapweed around here. I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, I know there's some in Elbert County that I've found. I think that might be the nearest to you. Um, and we have a couple different biocontrol agents that we collect and re-release on uh, these weeds. Uh, Larinus minutus is a lesser knapweed flower weevil, and Cyphocleonus acades is a knapweed root weevil. Um, the flower weevil uh, is a, likes diffuse knapweed better than spotted. It feeds on the seed heads, um, open flowers. It also feeds on the rosettes, which is important for the biocontrol. Um, it lays its eggs uh, deep in the flower head, and uh, the larvae eat out all the seeds. Um, the root weevil uh, feeds in the roots, as it says. Um, it's a little uh, bigger of a weevil. It's more like a pinto bean, kind of. Um, and it can really reduce and kill knapweed plants as well. Um, here's a, a shot of a knapweed with some uh, uh, Larinus minutus on it. Can you see those on the flower heads? If not, I circled them. Um, uh, so a lot in, in July and August, you can go out and find uh, beetles out on your diffuse knapweed. If they're there, that's good. If not, uh, you can give us a call and we'll get you some. Um, there's a weevil inside of an empty seed head. Um, that's what you'd like to see. Um, and then you'll see a lot, this a lot with the skeletons of diffuse knapweed. Um, uh, holes where um, uh, the larvae have eaten out all the seed heads. So you could look for that in your diffuse knapweed as well. Um, here's a, a big healthy diffuse knapweed rosette. Um, I said that was important for those adults to come out. They overwinter as adults, and they come out and they feed on those in the spring, and that's an important part of diffuse knapweed biocontrol. Uh, and there's a nice shot of the big uh, pinto bean sort of looking uh, sifo for spotted knapweed. Uh, toad flax. Uh, uh, the next one that Jonathan asked me to talk about was uh, toad flax. There's a couple different toad flaxes. I think you have more yellow in Douglas County than, than uh, Dalmatian. Dalmatian's... Uh, quite a bit in Jefferson County, Boulder, up into Larimer County. Um, uh, they're a little different than the leaves on yellow to, uh, toad flax or narrow. Actually, the, um, the growing plants sometimes can be confused a little bit with leafy spurge uh, when they're first coming out of the ground. Uh, the a main way to tell the difference would be to break off a little bit of the plant. If it has the milky latex, it's uh, leafy spurge. Um, if it doesn't, it's uh, yellow toad flax. Um, the leaves are narrow and pointed on yellow toad flax as opposed to a heart-shaped and wider clasping leaf of the Dalmatian toad flax. Um, there's some good photos of it. Um, 
the literature all says it's called butter and eggs, or people call it that. I've never heard anybody call it that, but I, I can see why. Uh, it's a very pretty flower. It is an uh, escaped perennial. Um, I think at one point we looked at uh, our noxious weeds in Colorado, and we found that 66% uh, of them were escaped ornamentals, and this happens to be one of them. Um, it, uh, it definitely likes the foothills, prairie, and gets up into the mountains as well. Um, our agent for that, uh, it's uh, Messinus janthinus. It's a, um, it's a weevil. Uh, the weevil lays its eggs uh, in the stem, and a lot of larvae uh, fit in stems. We'll, uh, where we get good toad flax uh, weevil numbers, we'll pull a stem up and dissect it and can have 20 to 40 larvae inside one stem. Um, this is established in Colorado. Um, there's two different, there's Messinus janthinus, which is for yellow toad flax, and Messinus janthiniformis, that's for Dalmatian toad flax. Um, the Dalmatian toad flax one is working really well for us. Uh, this janthinus one is, is not working quite as well. It's worked, it's taken longer at some places, it took, took a little longer to get established. Uh, but we finally do have it established in a few places, and it's looking promising. Uh, Montana kind of has the opposite. They have really good luck with this yellow toad flax weevil, um, and the, their Dalmatian toad flax weevil isn't quite as effective. Uh, I'm not sure why those are, but we're doing a phenology study. We're studying the, uh, the development and growth of yellow toad flax and the weevils. Uh, hopefully that'll help us elucidate why some of these things aren't quite working well and give us some management options. Um, the uh, one interesting thing about these weevils is that they overwinter as adults in the stem of the plant, um, which uh, helps us collect. We can collect stems in the fall, and that's a really good way to collect them. Um, so they lay their eggs. The larvae um, feed in the stems, and... Um, and uh, they pupate in the stems and then like the adults stay in the stems through the fall. Uh, so here's our releases. You can see not, compared to Aphthona, not very many releases. Um, but a few of them have been here in Douglas County and we have a few uh, test plots we're working on here. Uh, and then I got some cool pictures of small little weevils. They're only about uh, three millimeters long as well, maybe four at the longest. They're little tiny grains of rice. Um, so. Uh, how do you get biocontrols? Well, the best way to do it is to Google Palisade Insectary. Uh, you could also look for Colorado Department of Ag, but the Palisade Insectary is the best, and we have a request a, bug, a request a bug program that where we sell some of these agents, and you can see the prices are there and their availability. Uh, you can also call us toll-free at 866-324-2963. Uh, but really, most of our uh, orders are now coming through online. Uh, there's a nice little request a bug form. You put in your information, uh, click which weeds you have. Um, and this year, for the first time, we're going to have credit card payments. So before, it's all been in checks. Uh, but now we're going to be able to take credit cards this year. So we're pretty excited about that. And i got to thank my colleagues at the Palisade Insectary because they do a lot of the work that I can talk about, uh, including Dr. Bean, who's the director. Um, if you're really interested in toad flax, uh, Mike Reset is our uh, Toad Flax program manager, and that his email address is right there. Um, and then uh, our program wouldn't exist and work well without our federal, state, uh, county, and municipal uh, collaborators. So I want to thank them. And that's it. And are we taking questions, or how are we doing that? Going to take questions? Okay. How do I do that? Okay. If you have a question for John, uh, you can raise your hand if you're attending on WebEx. The hand raising option is down in your bottom right corner. You can also place your questions in the chat and I will be able to read them to John uh, directly. So please raise your hand if you have a question and then I will call on you when it's time to speak. have a question here from Gretchen. I have a low growing spurge around my patio. How should I handle that? Leafy spurge, or is it, there's different spurges. So um, I guess, uh, what's the really nasty one? Myrtle spurge. Uh, if it's low growing, it might be myrtle spurge, which uh, is will really burn your skin if you get that latex on you. So if you're going to pull uh, 
Myrtle Spurge, you definitely want to wear gloves, glasses, long sleeves, um, and be and you want to get rid of that because it can spread. But um, if it's just a, a small amount of spurge, um, you know, dig it up would be my. I wouldn't do biocontrol for a small amount of leafy. It depends on how much you got, but I, I would dig it up probably. Here's a question from Elaine. Do these bugs need to be repopulated each year? Um, we sometimes, yes. Uh, if they don't establish it first, um, I anecdotally, um, for, for the aphthona and leafy spurge, I have customers like some years it's a biocontrol agent. So, uh, depending on the whims of nature, sometimes collection isn't great. Um, we either miss it or it's just a bad year for the beetles. And so we don't, get shipments out to people and people have said that uh they put out releases every year and it really keeps leafy spurge at bay um the years that we haven't been able to provide beetles the spurge has spread a bit so um for some places they might not overwinter um and they might need to be supplemented or augmented um with a with an additional release so that can be uh, the case thank you john Mm -hmm. Another question, this one from Christy. Are there any weed predators for Russian thistle that would be harmful to the rest of my five acres in Castle Pines? Um, there have been a couple biocontrol agents that have been released for Russian thistle, but none of them were really effective. Um, so there's nothing available right now. Um, I don't know if I've ever really seen anything feeding on Russian thistle. Um, there has been a, a plant pathogen identified, which would be really promising, but it's got to get through some of the regulatory hurdles and approvals. Um, and so that's, that's a number of years down the line. Hey, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question here from Steve. What size areas are best for biocontrol? Oh boy, that's a tough question. That's actually one of the harder questions that we get. Like how many releases should we do? So sometimes releases are kind of limited. So my suggestion would always be to try them out, uh, one or two releases on a small area, uh, where you can monitor them, get back to it and check them out. Um, if that seems to work for you and you need more releases in future years, go for that. Um, Biocontrol is definitely something that requires patience. You're not going to necessarily, that, that beetle bomb is, is the exception. You're not going to see results like that year over uh, the next year, typically. We're talking a three to five year process, sometimes 20 years. There's a ranch in Douglas County, and those folks I talked to, um, they got rid of all their knapweed, and then it comes back. And what they found over 20 years of working with the beetles is to have a little reserve of, of, of beetles around really helps keep their knapweed in check. Um, they weren't able to eradicate knapweed from their property, but having the beetles around really helps. So I don't know if that really answers. I'm sorry, that doesn't really answer your question. Um, uh, it depends on how big your infestation is, I guess. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan's rule of thumb, one acre or more. And I, that's probably good. If you're less than an acre, uh, there's probably other uh, methods uh, and eradication might really be what you want to look at, which would be an herbicide or mechanical option, um, depending on what you want. Um, I did want to say, I get a lot of people asking me before somebody even asks about mowing. Um, and I, I'm not sure mowing, especially diffuse knapweed is a good idea. I really, I don't know. I think Dr. Beck uh, talks about that too. I don't know if he'll be on to answer questions, but um, you could create more problems by mowing than not, so. Is that it? All right, thank you, John. Any right. last uh, call for questions? All right, I'm seeing no more questions. If you do come up with some more questions that you'd like for John, you can email them to jreif at douglas.co.us. I will put that email address in the chat. Or you can email me right there too. Thank you.